So we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everyone to the Aspetuck Land Trust Lunch and Learn series. My name is Jean Stetspachelski, and I'm the moderator for today's program. We're in for a treat today as we welcome Pam Roman to share with uh, to share with us her backyard restoration project, Invasives to Natives. This is the sixth in our series of lectures to inspire all of us to improve biodiversity in our region by making small changes and how we treat our yards and gardens. So before we get started, I just want to talk to everyone about how we're utilizing Zoom today so we can get the most efficiency out of, uh, out of our experience, have a seamless webinar experience today. It is a webinar, so we do not see all of you. You see us and you can go up to the corner. There is a view button. You can change it to speaker only or gallery uh, to, uh, you guys make that decision on how you'd like to view the screen today. We will be recording this session. So the recording will be sent out. The link will be sent out for people who, to people who registered. And we will be uh, collecting all of the questions and answering those at the end. Pam and I will be working together with Mel and of course Shana, who is in the background with us at all times, helping us with technology. And if you notice at the bottom of your screen, you have Zoom controls. One of them is a Q&A and one is chat. We ask you to put your questions either in the Q&A or the chat and we'll curate those at the end. So I'd like to move this over to Mel, our um, introduce as our Aspetuck Land Trust Director of Landowner Engagement. We uh, refer to her as Mel and her name is actually Mary Ellen LeMay. So you'll uh, take it over, Mel, and introduce our speaker. And everybody, it's great to be here with you today. Enjoy. Um, well, thank you very much, Jean. And um, I, 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 uh, thank you and shout out back to you, Jean, for uh, volunteering your time for all these Lunch and Learns and, and uh, being the voice of, of um, introduction. Um, uh, Jean uh, runs her own uh, company here in Easton, which is an executive coaching um, company. And so we thank her for her dedicating her time as an Aspetuck Land Trust volunteer and longtime supporter um, to take her skills and share it with us during these lunch and learns. So thank you, Jean, very much. Um, and so I wanted to introduce our speaker today. Um, and th this is, as Jean said, the sixth uh, lunch and learn that we've had this year. Um, as landowner engagement director, my job is to uh, try to educate and inspire people um, to make some changes in their backyard that will increase biodiversity um, and also uh, provide people with action steps that they can take, uh, whether it is like you'll hear today, removing invasives and planting natives. And um, we are on the verge of, of launching our uh, plant sale, our native plant sale, which is one of the biggest action steps for people to take to get those plants into the backyard. So um, we're having some technical difficulties on the plant sale site, but it will be going out within a day or so. But I wanted to um, share with you a little background on our speaker today. Um, Pam Roman is a former book publishing executive um, who works with the Trumbull Nature Center as an educator and the Northeast Pollinator Pathway Team. Pam is also a volunteer on the Trumbull Conservation Commission with me and, and the Sustainable Trumbull Committee. And she's currently an intern in Yukon's Master Garden Program. Uh, Pam, Pam lives in Trumbull. Um, and uh, I personally met Pam in February of 2020, just before COVID hit. Um, I was doing the first pollinator pathway um, launch uh, and lecture for my own town of Trumbull. And Pam saw the announcement, offered to provide it for refreshments, and I assume she was bringing munchkins and a box of Joe. However, she arrived um, with an amazing spread of home-baked cookies and cupcakes and lemonade and a beautiful cheery tablescape with pictures of pollinator plants above the table. She totally had me at cupcakes. <laughs> and history since then has been watching this amazing woman take the skills and challenges from her former life and put that energy into transforming her backyard into a habitat for pollinators and birds. So it's a dream come true for me to have Pam here today sharing her journey with us. And I'm sure many of you will be inspired by her story. So a big welcome for my friend, Pam Roman. So take it away, Pam. 
Oh, thanks, Mel, that was very kind. Uh, when you asked me to be here today, I was delighted and humbled. You know, I'm a fan of the Lunch and Learns. So I was a little bewildered too, because you've had such great panelists here before, people with degrees in horticulture and design. And I don't have that. I'm a carpenter's daughter who likes to do projects indoors, outdoors, and I'm a gardener. Um, I've always liked getting my hands dirty and doing things myself. I do some light carpentry, I do some plumbing, but I'd rather be outside. For today's presentation, I'm going to be talking about a project that did start in March of 2020 and is still not finished. Now, I've always gardened. Wherever I've lived, I've had some sort of green space and I've been in this house since 2003. Many of the plants that are here, like that azalea you see in the upper right, I inherited. But the stone wall, the roses, the vegetable garden, and the garden that you see on the bottom right, I put in myself. Now, none of this, I never thought about native versus invasive versus non-native. It just wasn't in my vernacular. I planted things that I liked for color, and I did it all in my spare time. So just full disclosure to the crowd here today, my garden is not 100% native, and it probably won't ever be 100% native. I've got roses and peonies and hellebore and lilac, and I love them, and I'm not gonna dig them out. But as the garden matures and as I clear out things and add in natives, I'm confident that I'll get to that 70% that is recommended, at least 70% native is what you should strive for. Now I mentioned I did gardening in my spare time because for more than 25 years, I did work, as you mentioned, in the publishing industry. I commuted from here into New York City and it was a five hour a day commute. So it was an investment in a job that I loved, a company that I adored, and with people that I thought were the smartest people on the planet. Um, the grind made it worth, worth it. But one day I walked in and like many people before me, I was part of a large corporate restructuring. And it was kind of a moment of, whoa, how am I ever gonna replace the life that I led, the people that I met, the people that I worked with, what future was I going to have that would ever match that? And every morning I would get up and I would go on the job boards, I'd go to outplacement, I'd network. You know, if you ever have lost your job, you know that you can feel regret, you can feel guilt, you're filled with a lot of self-doubt. And I was no exception, I was really, it was a seismic change for me to go from you know, 5.30 in the morning till seven at night to nothing. So I needed some joy in my life. And I had my husband make good on a promise. He always said, when you don't work in New York anymore, we can get a dog. Well, uh, guess what? I'm not working in New York anymore. So that's little Kipper. And if you've had a pet in your life, you know they can change everything. Every day we went for a walk and I got to know the trails of Trumbull like I never had before, even after living here for you know, 19 years. We went to the Pequannock River Valley and hiked through every trail, you know, two miles or more every single morning. He became a huge addition to our family. Even my cat Louie loved him. And alongside getting to know nature and getting in touch with nature more and exercising, I was sleeping more and I was eating better. Weather never stopped us. We went every single day. And look, he even helped me with my garden. I was still itchy though, to get to know people locally. Most of my friends were in New York City back at work. I never had time to really meet people locally and get to know very many people locally. 
So one day I said, well, you like nature and you like volunteering, maybe it's time to volunteer. And so I Googled nature and Trumbull and up popped this website for the Trumbull Nature and Arts Center, a little gem here in Trumbull. And I'd driven past it a million times, uh, but never really dug into what it was. So I asked if I could volunteer and I was actually brought into as a counselor for the day camps that summer. And it was so much fun showing these little kids the pond and the trails and rabbits and even just taking a piece of uh, mint and letting them smell it. And kids were so much fun and hugging me when they left. And what that did for me was it made me realize that I could imagine a life outside of a corporate job. The president of the board of Trumbull Nature and Arts Center is Kevin Malone. And he's a terrific guy. And he said to me one day, well, if you're you know, passionate about the environment, I'm also leading up a team called Sustainable Trumbull, if you're interested. Oh, why not? Sounded good to me. And as Mel mentioned earlier, that's where I met her. I attended her Pollinator Pathway event just before the COVID pandemic began. And there should have been a picture taking of me in the back of the room listening to her because I was blown away, just gobsmacked by the information that I learned there. Um, everything that I was doing in my yard, just about everything was wrong. We had a lawn company putting poison on our lawn every week, it seemed like. Um, I never thought about natives. And she talked a little bit about invasive plants as well. Now, I hate to be cliche, but sometimes I am. And in this case, I'm going to be. They say the people you meet along the way can make a big difference in your life. And it's not hyperbole when I say that Kevin Malone and Mary Ellen LeMay changed my life. They helped me pivot from that corporate grind that I was in, and it's all I knew, to a life that was going to be so different. So let's talk a little bit about these invasive plants. Um, this is not going to be a how-to so much as it's going to be my story, but I am gonna show you some of my greatest hits. All of these are in my yard, all of them. Well, at least they were. Um, after Mel's lecture, I started to read more about invasive plants. We fired the lawn company. I said, you know, I don't care about the lawn anymore. It's ridiculous. Um, and I had barberry, Japanese barberry in the front yard. And I said, okay, that's going to be the first to go. Um, for anyone who's a master gardener who's attending this, I am sorry, but I'm not going to be using any of the Latin today. I'm going to be using the common names. <laughs> So this is Japanese barberry. Um, the yard that we inherited had four or five of these planted in the front yard, along with two giant burning bush. And I learned about barberry from Mel in that seminar and how destructive it could be. And if you go on after this seminar and you Google bar barberry and Lyme disease, you're gonna be shocked to find that Japanese barberry is a hotbed for Lyme disease. Um, there's a lot of reasons why, but it shelters the white-footed mouse, which is a tick carrier. Ticks love the plant. And so I pulled them all out immediately. And this is what it looks like. It's got these really sharp thorns. It's got yellow roots. Um, it's very easy to grow and it spreads like crazy. In fact, I've seen it in the Pequannock River Valley on the east side where it's wild. I've seen it there. This is garlic mustard. This is a biennial, which means that it has a two year life cycle. This is the first year plant here. And this is the second year plant with the flowers. You know, all these invasives are very persistent and very hard to get rid of. And you can see why this one might be. This is a rosette that I just pulled out the other day, a first year rosette. Look how long that, that root is. You have to be persistent with everything. It's never over. 
The picture on the lower left is a side garden that I've had for many years now. And when we had our driveway redone, my husband was kind enough to ask the guy with the backhoe to dig out the knotweed for me. I knew that I had knotweed. I really didn't know that much about it, but it had to go, right? So, and I couldn't, I could not physically get it out. But what the guy did rather than removing it was he spread it across the whole area. And when I got home that day, it looked like a nice, neat uh, field of dirt for me to plant. But upper left, not weed will grow from a very small piece of root. It is brutal. It's a miserable weed of a plant and it's everywhere you look. If you live in Trumbull and you go to Old Mine Park and walk by the river, it's huge there. Behind Trumbull High School by the river, it's everywhere. So I'm not gonna tell you how to get rid of this so much because Mel has a fabulous Nix the Knotweed seminar next week and you can join then. But it took me two summers with a garden fork and many tears to get the garden that you see on the lower right, which is now knotweed free. Many people like certain invasives. Uh, people plant barberry, people plant burning bush and people don't take out the wine berry that might be in their yard because it has some pretty tasty little berries. But the problem with it is, is it spreads voraciously. Uh, it's fairly easy to get out the, if you can get past the thorns. But, you know, if, if the bird eats the berries and then poops out the seeds, you're going to have a whole yard full of it if you don't watch it. Everybody knows bittersweet. You see it on the side of the road. If you look at, you know, see if I can get this laser pointer to work. Here's a bittersweet vine climbing up into the tree. And that's what it does. It climbs up, girdles the tree trunk, climbs up into the canopies of the trees and kills them. It's an awful plant. I despise it. Um, I see no value in it, except I know that the birds eat the berries and that's how you get more plants again. If you pull it out, you'll notice that it's got a bright red root. I don't like invasives, but I hate burning bush. It is sold at nurseries around the state. It's very easy to grow. You can't kill it. It's tough, right? But I'm going to ask you to remember this point when we get farther into the presentation, because I want you to remember what that root ball looks like. Look at the size of that thing. And that's not that old of a plant. Um, you'd recognize this by its bright red foliage, foliage in the fall. And that's why it gets plants very pretty in the fall. And it spreads these berries. They fall to the ground and you get millions, uh, millions of small plants. Um, you think you've pulled it out on the lower right, you're gonna see, you're gonna have to keep looking for it because it'll grow from a small piece of root. So how did I know all this time? I mean, I'm no expert, right? How did I know what I was pulling out? Well, my advice to you is there's a lot of resources online. There are a lot of really good resources online for you to look how to find the invasives, how to identify them, how to get rid of them, and what to plant in their place. For me, I went outside with my phone every day, and it was just easier for me to have a couple of apps. And picture this as a paid app. You have to pay for it every year but it was worth it for me. It, it's not 100% accurate, so you do have to keep that in mind. Uh, Seek is free. I think Seek is better for insects, but it's another option. And then if you Google Yukon invasive plants, they have a tremendous resource there, um, including a brochure on the top 10 invasives in Connecticut, how to get rid of them and what to plant instead. So I would recommend that highly. So let's talk about the project. Yeah, um, I'm looking for work every day. There's not much going on because this pandemic is starting and the weather's getting kind of nice. So since I can't go anywhere, I think I'm gonna go out and just start raking. Um, two years later, I'm still not done, but we'll get to that. So what I have here is Wineberry growing. And you can see how many. This is why I was telling you about it. It just it keeps multiplying. There's also a little foreshadowing of things to come here with this green. 
That's burning bush. And there's a lot of it on the property. But at this point, I was really focused on getting this side, the, the west side of my yard cleared so I could plant some native plants. Now, I hadn't touched this in the whole time I've lived here. I hadn't touched this and it wasn't touched before I moved here. So I'm guessing that this part of my yard had been in this condition for more than 20, probably 30 plus years. And uh, the tarp was kind of naive. There was no way that that tarp was gonna be enough. And as I started to make progress, I kind of got obsessed with the project and the idea that I could get rid of the invasives. So every day I would grab a pitcher of water, bring out some music, grab my dog, and I'd go out for anywhere from four to six hours. Uh, and I'd be out there all day, pulling by hand all these weeds. Now you see, I'm gonna show you another picture here, another view of that same area. You can see here that I'm not pulling out the burning bush. I pulled out some young ones, but as you noticed in the slide prior, the root ball on that thing is tough. You can't pull it out by hand. It takes a Herculean effort to get rid of it. So I thought to myself, I'm just gonna cut them down and then I'll come back for them another time or I won't. Now, how did I do this? I don't own a Kubota. So I was doing it all by hand at this point. And my favorite tools are, I mean, I wouldn't have done anything without the garden fork, a really strong garden fork and the pick, but I like a steel rake. I used a lopper. I found that I needed gloves with, especially with all that raspberry and wineberry, I needed gloves that would cover my forearms. And because I don't spray my yard for ticks, I used uh, a spray every day and I still had to check myself when I came in every afternoon. As I got farther south in my yard, I started to think that I might have had my head examined before I started this because the brush was so much thicker and I was finding newer plants in here that were going to be tougher on me than the wineberry was. So now I have privet. I have a lot of bittersweet. The whole area is sick with it. I've got wild grape here. Now, grape is a native plant. So I'm gonna acknowledge that right up front, but sometimes it's in the wrong place and this was in the wrong place. There's also the greening here of all the burning bushes. Less than a month later, I had gotten that west side of the yard sort of cleared in a, in a way that I thought it was acceptable. I could put the fork in and only come up with dirt. And I read that if you don't plant it right away, you're gonna be sorry. You, you, you wanna stop any resurgence of any seed bank there. So I went out and looked for ways to seed this rather quickly. And I was in BJ's and I saw this bag of wildflower pollinator mix. I mean, look at that bag, it tracks nature's pollinators. For $9.99, I got a big bag of seed and I was psyched, I put it down and I've learned since then to read the fine print on the back of these seed mixes because well, I'll show you in a minute, flowers were pretty. I had bees and butterflies for sure, but only three of the seeds that were in this bag were from the US and only two of them were native to Connecticut. So, you know, if you're gonna go for one of these and you're gonna, you wanna be native, you're not gonna get there. So here's how it's seeded. And very quickly, I had some really pretty flowers. I was happy with that. I had some zinnias come up in there too. And the routine became sacrosanct to me. Every morning we'd walk, have our adventure, and then come home and go outside. I was seeing a change in the yard for sure. But I was also feeling a change in me. I was certainly healthier and stronger. Um, I was losing weight because I was out there all day long. And then I'd come in 
check myself for ticks, take a nice shower, and then have a healthy dinner and a glass of wine. But I'd need the confidence that that clearing gave me for when I entered the southern part of my yard. Um, this here in the center is grape. And you can see from the size of it that it's very established. It's an interesting plant. I, I give it a lot of, uh, I give it kudos because it has a will to survive like nothing else. And it sort of climbs up into the tree, into the canopy of the tree, and then it lifts and it dives into the dirt and it comes out here. Um, I had it everywhere, everywhere. And what was bad about the grape, besides the fact that it was strangling this poor tulip tree, was that the bittersweet was going along for the ride. So that is one of the thousands of bittersweet vines that I cut and pulled out uh, along the, the journey here. I was pulling them out with by hand or with a pick or with the fork, um, but some were just too big. And then you see in behind me, all these burning bush and what I could pull out by hand, I was, and then the rest I would just cut and leave. They had kind of a symbiotic relationship, the grape on the right and the bittersweet on the left. There was no way for me to save one and not the other, even though the grape was native. And I've learned over time that there's invasive, there's native, there's near native, but also there's unwanted. And if you've got a place in your yard where you don't want this to grow, then you, know, you don't have to have it necessarily. I also had quite a bit of pokeweed in the yard and you all should recognize this. You've probably seen it all over the place. This is a native plant. It's very aggressive. The birds love the berries and they, they eat them and they drop the seeds and those seeds don't waste any time. They grow immediately. And if you've tried to take out pokeweed, the root on the thing is at least 12 inches long. It's like a big white carrot. So I had so much of it that I haven't removed all of it, but I removed quite a bit of it. The grape was no match for my lopper and I hated our gas powered chainsaw. So when my husband had time, I'd have him come out and use it and, and cut this for me. I, I figured that I was gonna be living with this thing in the ground since it was so established. Um, but what I did was once he made a cut, a fresh cut, I would paint the cut with a little glyphosate, which is also known as Roundup. And I don't like using that stuff, but sometimes you might need to. Um, it was only a last resort that I used that. What is behind all this stuff? Well, my yard must have looked like a mess because I was finding all kinds of things, garbage, bags of trash. And it made me feel, made me feel angry, but also sad that the yard looked like nobody lived here, nobody cared. Um, I even had a big piece of concrete that somebody dumped here. And I don't know how they did it because it was heavy. Um, I also had blacktop that I found from, must have been from when they redid the road behind me. They just let the blacktop fly into my yard. So I've still got more to clean up even now. But every day I would put the vines and the branches from things that I'd clear and I'd tote it out of here. And I probably would do about three to five of these a day. More amusingly, uh, I found a lot of golf balls here. Uh, they would, as I would move the dirt, I'd find more. I probably had a bucket by the time I was done. Apparently, we were on the edge of what used to be the Hillendale Country Club. And uh, I think the golf, club, the golf course closed in 1975. But uh, if anybody lost their title list, I think I found it. And I also found a lot of roots. So I was trying to turn the dirt to see if I could plant and I kept finding more and more roots. And, and most of it was grape and bittersweet. It just formed a network underneath all that, all that soil that was 
very discouraging. And in this section, you see the date stamp. This morning of May 2nd, I can see that I've got a stone wall back there. Um, I guess I knew in the back of my mind that we had a stone wall encircling our property, but since I had never seen it before, I was kind of psyched. Oh, well, that's kind of nice. Um, again, in this area, burning bush. It became kind of like, uh, I probably was saying it in my sleep, burning bush. Uh, but also in this section, I had multiflora rosa, which is very thorny. Lots of bittersweet, lots of grape. And for a bonus, I had a downed tree in here. But by the end of that day, I had made pretty good progress. And um, I was feeling it, you know? I, when you do something like this and you start to see how things are paying off, it spurs you on, or it spurred me on anyway, to the next day and the next day. Um, I'm gonna mention rocks here. They'll present themselves later in the presentation again, but you can see I'm starting to make piles of rocks. And if you've ever gardened in the state of Connecticut, you know why. You stick your fork in, you pull out three rocks. Three days later, I am thinking, hey, you know, I think I'm gonna be able to plant here in a few days. This is looking good. Um, I've still got some burning bush stumps here and here. I, I can't get them out. They're not coming. Um, so I decided I'd start turning the soil. And I'm still, by the middle of May, digging out roots. And you can see back here, these are grape and bittersweet roots. I dig them up, I cut them, I dig up. And by now, I can't close my hands anymore in the morning. They're so stiff from literally pulling weeds for two months. So I said, you know, I think I'm gonna give in a little bit here. And I hired a backhoe for a half a day. It was like Christmas when he came and showed up. I was hopeful he was gonna do everything else for me. And look at that pile of rocks. And he did, he did do a fair amount. He dug out a couple of the burning bush stumps that I couldn't get. He moved a big privet that I couldn't move and he helped move some brush for me, but it was not a panacea for the problem that I had. In hindsight, you know, I probably should have kept him for the whole day, but it wasn't working. I didn't have the money. And honestly, he told me he'd be done in half a day. Now I know. I know now as a master gardener intern that I should have had my soil tested, but I didn't know it then. To me, the dirt back there felt very powdery. And as I got near close to planting, I ordered a truckload of garden soil. And uh, no, I didn't move it with that fork. That would have been silly. I moved it with my lawn tractor and a big cart on the back. And I did it cart by cart. And I'll tell you, it looked like less than it actually was. It took forever to move the dirt. <laughs> but it was the part that was getting fun because now I've purchased plants from Aspatuck Land Trust's plant sale. And I've got some really good stuff that's going in. And a vision for the area started to develop. Um, what more can I do with this area than just putting in shrubs? I, I already had some uh, chokeberry, choke, choke cherry that I had bought, but I wanted it to look like a meadow. I was thinking about what it would look like in a year or two. And you can see there that I've got some garden edging there because I decided that I noticed that there was a hole in the wall as I cleared everything. And you know, when you're out there working for hours at a time, you start to imagine what that hole in the wall was for. Was, was there a path that you, people used to walk through many, many, many years ago? Well, maybe I should embrace that and add some interest to this big wide area. So I started to scout for materials and um, I had some flat rocks. I had a lot of rocks, but I had some flat rocks that were pretty on the property. I found some bluestone on Facebook Marketplace for pretty cheap. And then I made these leaf-shaped 
concrete pavers out of colored concrete and I used hosta leaves as a mold. And I thought they were kind of pretty. Uh, I set them in and I put some black concrete down. Now, if you look at this, you know I'm never gonna be a stonemason. But my imperfect garden, as I like to call it, is, was never intended in my mind to be like a topiary garden. I wanted it to look natural. I wanted it to look kind of like me, you know, kind of a mess, kind of a devil may care meadow was the way I imagined it. So the walkway worked for me. By December, when I'm ready to put things to bed, I've got all of Mel's plants in, and, and you can see here the list of things that I, that I planted as either plugs or shrubs, including a little service berry tree. I was delighted to find that I had, and I'm gonna see if I can do this again. I had a butternut tree here that had been covered in vines for years and years. I kept that. And behind me in this picture is a shagbark hickory um, neither one of these trees is in amazing shape because they were so covered in vines, but I'm hoping that they'll recover nicely in the years to come. I, I did have butternuts last year. But another bag of seeds that I bought from a website this time called American Meadows. Wow, what a great name for a website. And they've got some beautiful seed mixes. But again, I did not look to see that they were native. So I put them down and I was excited for spring and indeed in the spring, I was so excited. You know, I'd walk out and look at this empty space all winter and I felt proud of the work that I had done. And I wouldn't say that I was brimming with self-confidence. I mean, when you lose your job after a long, long time, you have a lot of things going through your mind, but I'll tell you, I felt pretty good. And I was excited to see how this was going to grow. And here we are in spring with the daffodils coming up and you can just about see the seeds are starting to take hold and bloom come up. This is what that area looked like the year before. And by June, I had a meadow. And I know that these are California poppies. They were in that seed mix, but they were so beautiful. It looked like a Monet painting. Now the, the area wasn't all non-native. I did have natives in there. In fact, you can see as I'm standing here on a beautiful June day, the plants I bought from Aspatuck were doing really nicely. In fact, here are some, this is first year growth. This is New York ironweed here. And it's got a couple of different bees on it. In this other picture in the foreground is mountain mint. I've got wild bergamot, I've got Joe pie, and I've got the ironweed. I was so excited to see how well these plants were doing. But yet, it felt unfinished to me. So this is spring of 21. And I'm looking at all this burning bush. I call this the corner from hell. And it was, it was like, oh my God, how am I ever going to do this? I can't leave it. It looks terrible. I can't afford a backhoe again. I had a local guy come and give me a price just for this corner alone. It went under $2,000. I'm like, yeah, nope, not happening. So my friend Louise came over and she told me that her landscaper pulled it out in her yard with his truck. So I started to think about that. And um, I said, you know, maybe she's got something there. So meet my new favorite tool. This is called a brush grubber. And that thing clamps on to the plant of choice and with a chain attaches to your lawn tractor, your ATV, and we'll pull out things better than I could do with my hands. Um, I tried it with the lawn tractor and the lawn tractor started to make some really unsettling noises. So I switched gears. My old reliable RAV4 
to the rescue. I can tell you, <laughs> pop that thing made when it came out of the ground was so cathartic. I'm gonna play that again. Yeah, not today, Satan. <laughs> so when I realized that I could take this out with my car quite efficiently, I drove that car in the backyard every day and went through the front yard. All my neighbors must have thought I was nuts, but I didn't care because, oh, we'll do it again. But look at this. How was I ever going to do this without my car? It wasn't going to happen. Look at the size of that burning bush. Um, my husband was very kind. He bought me an electric chainsaw. You can see it over here. This is an ego chainsaw. I'll tell you what, that thing is, I'll never go back to gas again. That thing is amazing. I recommend it highly. But you could see I put these in my little lawn tractor with the car and towed everything away. And I would do dozens of them a day. This is a side yard picture from many years ago. <clears throat> you know, most of the pictures I took, I took for myself just to keep track of what I was doing. I, I never thought that I'd be doing a webinar for Aspatog, but I have quite a few of them. This is an old one, but it very clearly shows you how much burning bush I had in my yard. Now that's a very beautiful silver maple in the foreground and it's still here, but that burning bush had to go. So every day I'd go out with my car and I'd pull a few more. I've got the stone wall behind a garden and I would shimmy my car in reverse in there, making sure I wasn't gonna hit any of the boulders and I'd pull them out. Um, again, 10, between 10 to 20, maybe even more a day would come out. And this is what that area that I showed you with the silver maple looked like after I was done in this one area. Of course, I have more sunlight, so that gives me a little more flexibility in planting, but I think I've uncovered quite a seed bank here. And the weeding thing is never over, right? Like all summer long last year, when I wasn't pulling out weeds with my car, I was out there making sure nothing was coming back in my flowers, but I didn't really wanna to have to handle all this burning bush seed bank. So I went out and scrounged for cardboard, I made a little border with some logs that had fallen. And I made a path with the cardboard and the mulch. I used cardboard because I've had very bad luck with landscaping fabric. The stuff comes through it anyway. And I didn't want black plastic because it always ends up showing. So what I read was that the cardboard would mulch. But in the meantime, I was suffocating the seed bank there. So hopefully it's gonna work and I won't have a resurgence of burning bush in this area. And then on the left, I went to a wonderful store in Fairfield called Native and I bought uh, some native ferns, barren strawberry and wild ginger. And I'm hoping that this is going to be just this beautiful shade woodland garden. I showed you the perimeter of the area that I planted last year and that I was gonna leave the burning bush. Well, um, now I'm a woman on a mission. And so I would back my car in and I would pull some out and I started to carve out an area to get in to the deepest part of my yard. And so here's June 10th. And by July 1st, I had, I'm guessing 200, you know, in hindsight, I probably should have counted them, but at least 200 burning bush were removed. And I was really excited to find that I had some good trees back here. I found black gum trees, red maples, of course, the ubiquitous tulip trees, but I also had spice bush. I was probably most excited to find two very young American elm trees. Now with Dutch elm disease, I don't know that they'll live, but it made me feel happy to see them. This is the way that section looked in mid-September. I was pretty psyched. It looked like a different yard entirely. And uh, I know it's gonna take a lot of 
resources, my own resources to keep all that burning bush from coming back. But I'm still not finished because behind me, I still have the corner from hell. Now what's in here? I had a huge tulip tree that had fallen many years before, probably during Hurricane Sandy. So I had this giant root thing in the air, down trees, <clears throat> lots and lots of burning bush, bittersweet. Kind of the trifecta, man. I was really not looking forward to this. So with the chainsaw added to my repertoire, I started cutting up the tree. But the reality is I also had poison ivy back here. And that's another native. I know we need to coexist with it because it does benefit birds and wildlife. But there was no way that I was gonna get this burning bush out of there if I didn't take out the poison ivy. And I am allergic to it. So I got myself a Tyvek soup. <laughs> and I felt silly, but I'll tell you what, in a day I had it all bagged up. Um, I still got poison ivy. I got it where the glove met sleeve. So lesson learned for next time. But all in all, I was pretty successful at clearing this area. And by October 15th, I was planting. And again, um, I, I went to Mel's fabulous fall Aspartec plant sale and I picked up some things that, that I had read would be good for a shady area. I have uh, two wintergreen, winterberry, foam flower. I've got low bush blueberry in there. I've got bearberry. And then I found, you know, in clearing, I found some things just growing. A little oak tree there was growing on the property. So I saved it. I had some American red cedar seedlings that I put in that were just growing around the yard. And I found a holly bush that I know my neighbor has one, so it must have come from there, but I had holly, so I put those in as well. This is what the yard looked like as the leaves started to turn. And, you know, the older I get, the more reflective I've gotten. Um, I reflected a lot in, in those two summers about the things you can do if you put your heart into it. And, and certainly, I don't recommend that everybody brings their car into their backyard. I mean, I needed a new power steering shaft by the time it all was said and done, don't tell anybody. Um, but I challenged myself and I aspired for more. You know, dream, you dream about what you want. And to me, I kind of got there. And the older I get, the more philosophical I've gotten. And I think about what my time on earth means. What's my legacy? So I did this list that I wrote and I did it for myself, but I'm gonna share it with you. And not in any order, <clears throat> but your job doesn't define you. You learn who your friends are and who they're not. You should savor every healthy moment you have. Feeling regret or guilt doesn't help. Try and let it go. Easier said than done. Volunteering feels good. Spending time with the people you love is never time wasted. It's okay to cry, but it's so much more fun to laugh. Exercise, sleep, and healthy eating are underrated. So is cake but I didn't put it on the list. Nature heals, it does. And some things are out of your control. 10 days after I finished the project, I lost my kipper. Three weeks later, his friend Louie went with him. It's so sad, right? But I'm so grateful to him. He guided me through such a rough patch. He filled me with joy. He helped me look forward to every single day. And now, as I look outside in another spring, I'm filled with hope again. Maybe this is my legacy. 
you know, the, the impact, in my little acre here, it might be small, but maybe it matters to some creatures. Maybe it'll matter to the people that have this house after me. The impact might be small in a geographic sense. I don't know, but my space is buzzing with life and with beauty. It gives me solace to look at all the work I've done and how it's paid off. Nature is healing. And since I got rid of the pesticides and did the clearing in my yard, I've seen orioles and bluebirds and grosbeaks. I've been here since 2003. I, I never had them here before, really. And last summer at dusk, I called my husband to the window. I said, look, our whole lawn was illuminated with fireflies. And I saw one or two on my neighbor's yard, but it's got to be something to do with the changes I've made. Is it a coincidence? I don't think so. I mentioned that the yard isn't finished yet, and it's not, and probably never will be. But for this year, I've got another corner from hell. <laughs> With the pandemic lifting though, and the couple of part-time jobs that I have and my master gardener course, I have less time on my hands than I did in the past but I'm determined to finish the backyard. And in this area, I've got Norway maples. Um, I've got some nice things in here. I've got sassafras trees, which are great, but I've also got lots of pokeweed, lots of grape, lots of multiflora rosa. Um, this is multiflora rosa, if you've ever seen it. I've also got Chinese wisteria in this area. And that's what a root looks like. That thing is brutal. I don't know how many, I'm gonna have to get the, the car back there again is what I'm gonna have to do to dig that out. Um, and this is a Norway maple trunk. You look at the shape of that. Um, if I could see you raise your hands, I'd ask you, what do you think did that? I pulled a bittersweet vine off of that tree trunk last year. Uh, that's how destructive bittersweet can be. But as it turns out that Norway maple might have to go too, because that's an invasive. Um, some of the smaller ones that I have, and I probably have about six or seven of them, the smaller ones might come down this year. Now, if you decide after this that you want to come and see my yard and you're going to drive by, I give you fair warning, my front yard is a disaster. I haven't really been out there very much. Uh, I lost a lot of grass last year to grubs, and by the time I got to them with a natural um, solution, it was too late. The grass is gone. Um, and I've got forsythia out there, which I know people like forsythia, but it's not a native plant. Um, and it's sheltering some bittersweet and it's sheltering a lot of burning bush back there. So um, maybe next year. Uh, I'm excited to see what my yard looks like when everything starts to bloom again. And I hope that I've inspired some of you to make even the small change in your yard today uh, I'm going to make myself available for some questions now. Thank you. Pam, thank you so much for that just beautiful presentation, both in sharing your images, your story, and you can just feel we'll be sharing the chat comments with you. There's so much support flooding out from the community that's joined us here today for your effort and for the impact you'll have for generations to come with this incredible work you've done to return this property uh, to a state of grace. So I'd love to share some uh, questions with you here today. Sure. One of our first ones, we have um, a question about eliminating invasive false strawberry. Do you have any suggestions for that? Well, I don't know that it's invasive. Um, and I'm not, again, I'm not an expert in all this stuff yet, but if you've got this the little strawberry in your yard in the grass, it's pretty hard to get rid of. You gotta pull it. But um, from what I understand, wildlife kind of likes it. So I've got it growing in my grass and I just really haven't focused on it at all because it doesn't bother me. I'm not really that fond of lawn. Um, 
I've learned over the past couple of years that a lawn is really not a good use of resources. It's, it's kind of, it's, that's just my, I know men love lawns, but I don't really pay much attention to my lawn anymore. And like I said, if you drove past my front yard, you'd notice that. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I don't have the solution for that, but I, I've tried pulling it. It's very stringy. It tends to drop down onto the ground again and reroute. So it's really tough to get rid of. Another question here. Um, what do you do with all of the invasives in that brush that you've cut back? Excellent question. I, I thought someone might ask me that. Well, some of it I brought to the town um, transfer station because they have a very large area for brush. It didn't all fit in my RAV. Um, most of it, I had the town come for a bulk pickup. They do bulk pickups here and they took away a ton of it. And then on the side in, in the back where I didn't think I'd care so much, I made brush piles. Um, I didn't think anything I was putting back there was going to regrow. So brush piles are actually really good for wildlife. It's a good shelter for wildlife and birds. So I've got a lot of it. Most of it is here. So some other questions here about, uh, one person is sharing that they've been trying to let their garden go in the fall and not cutting down perennials and tidying up. Mm -hmm. However, they're confused about when it's safe to cut down plants in the spring and they worry if they cut them too early, will they be disturbing insect larva? And so your idea, what would you offer in terms of what, when is it safe to tidy up the perennial garden? Well, I read something the other day because I wonder that myself. Um, I stopped cutting down my echinacea and all my other stalks a long time ago. It says, something that I read said, if you have seven con consecutive days that are 50 degrees and higher, then it's safe to do it. So I don't think we're there yet. It's been kind of chilly. So just give it a couple more weeks, maybe even, in, maybe this coming week, it's supposed to get warmer. So by the end of this week, maybe or next week. You've given some tips for removing the wineberry and the barberry. Do you have any more tips for getting rid of it? Those two in particular? Those two in particular were, were featured in the question. Well, they actually, the outside of the thorns on the barberry, it came out pretty easily. So what I would do and what I did was cut all the bush part of it. So you get down to the root base and then either get a pick, a good pick or a garden fork and just dig it out. Um, you'll know, I mean, the, the bright yellow roots, you can't miss them. So it actually came out pretty readily from where I had it. Um, and the wine berry, if you use a good glove or even something stronger than the glove, like put a glove on and then putting something else around your hand to grab it by the base, um, the wine berry comes right out in a clump. So turning to deer, people wondered if you had deer in the property and how do you deter deer if you do? Well, the, <laughs> I have, a lot of wildlife here. I have a lot of deer. Um, my backyard is up against some right of way open space. So I've had Bear 211 was here last year. I have coyote, I have fox. Um, I had a bobcat just the other day, but I certainly have deer. And uh, my vegetable garden is fenced in. So they don't bother that. And they tend to like certain things more than others. Um, they hadn't touched any of the meadow that I put in the back at all. They hadn't touched any of it. They seemed to like the day lilies that were here from before me. And for things that I do want them to stay away from, I've had pretty good luck with a spray called liquid fence, which smells terrible. And I've used it for years now with astonishingly, I'm going to, it's really good luck. It's got garlic in it. It's got a bunch of natural things in it. And when you mix it and you spray it on the plant, they smell it and they're like, yeah, no. And I think that they learn, even if it rains, they've, they've kind of got the idea when they come back in that that didn't taste good. So I would recommend that. I mean, you can't fence everything and they're, they're hungry and they're gonna come through. Um, if, you know, in a perfect world, I'd fence the whole yard, but I can't do that just yet. Mm. So moving on to another question, one of the other uh, plants people are struggling with is mudwort. Oh, yeah. And any ideas, experience with 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 that that particular? Um, yeah, I've got it. 
I've got it. I mean, years ago I saw it, I thought it was chrysanthemum, right? But then you look underneath and it's got, you know, it's not green underneath the leaf, it's almost white. Um, it's brutal. It's very persistent. So you have to just keep after it. And the roots on it tend to, I think, you know, if you, if you pull one, you can see the root is reaching to another plant and it comes up. I was at Twin Brooks Park today in Trumbull and um, that whole meadow has got it all over the place. And I don't know what you do about that. You got to dig it out. So where I have it in my yard, I use the garden fork to get underneath it and I pull it out. And I don't put that in the brush pile. I put it in the trash. Um, you can tell right away a mugwort baby seedling because they look just like the adult plant. They have the same shape leaf and I just don't let them grow. I don't let them get established. And I tell you, I spent probably as much time weeding for recurring things than I did pulling out big things. So it's a full-time job, but if you've got mugwort, you just have to keep going after it. Thanks, Pam. You mentioned something about grubs. What was the natural solution that you used for your grubs? Well, this is kind of, I don't know if it's funny, but I tried beneficial nematodes from a company called Arbico Organics. It's a mail order catalog that's all about organic solutions. And I couldn't get my sprayer to work. And I was really frustrated by the whole thing. They're, they're not inexpensive. They're, they're, they cost a lot of money. Um, so then I bought uh, milk spore, milky spore, milky spore. I bought it up at Benedict's. They should sell it everywhere, I think. And I put that down and you just put a spoon down, you walk around the yard and you keep just dropping it. And that seems to have worked. But I also found a product online called Grub Gone. And that is, uh, it's even on the Pollinator Pathway website as a safe solution for other uh, insects. So I used that as well. And I don't see any grubs out front. Of course, I don't see any grass either because I, I waited too long last fall but um, it seemed to have done the trick. Thank you. So questions about bittersweet. People are noticing that, you know, it's grown up tall. And when you, the question is, when you cut it down at the base, does the growth at the top just die off automatically? It does. I mean, I could never climb into those trees, the tulip trees that, that had it in their canopy. It just, I couldn't do it. And last winter, I had quite a bit fall out of the tree, mostly the grape, but um, you don't wanna pull it because you could break a branch. So I'm just letting nature take its course with it. And um, every year more falls out, more falls out of the tree. The, the grape, I mean, I know what Tarzan was swinging on because that thing is strong. You can't break it. It's so thick. Um, so I'm, it's not going to harm the tree anymore. They say that once you cut a bittersweet vine at the base, the tree feels relief almost immediately. It kind of lets go a little bit, but there's no point in really climbing up there to get it out unless you just hate the way it looks. So let nature take its course. There's a question here about how to protect new plantings from rodents like woodchucks. Well, you know, I hadn't, I had some woodchucks a few years ago, and then the bobcat came through. And I hadn't seen one until last fall when it went underneath my shed next to the garden. So there may be a battle this spring when the woodchuck emerges mm -hmm. with her young. But, um, you know, they all got to eat. And I don't, I don't really feel good about trapping them and moving them somewhere else. But if I find that it's really a problem out front, I mean, out back, I'm going to have to do that. And I know I would get a have a heart trap and I would try to rehome it, but I'm not going to do that when it has babies. So it's, it's, it's a personal choice. You know, I kind of like live and let live, but you know, if a deer were to come through and mow down my garden in, you know, an afternoon, I probably wouldn't feel that way. So I had um, woodchucks out front eating all my flocks 
And uh, that was a couple of years ago. And I used the liquid fence on that and I had some success with it. It doesn't taste good to anybody. It's, it says rabbit and deer on the front, but <laughs> I don't think the woodchucks care for it either. So Pam, um, I just wanted to jump in because I had um, some notes on that uh, about the groundhog and they're called, um, it's called using a distraction crop. And it definitely works on my lawn. I have tons of clover and you know alfalfa and um, wild strawberry and they eat that. So they don't even make it to my garden because they're so fat they can barely get themselves under my shed from the clover. Mm -hmm. So um, using a, a distraction crop, um, it works for me and it's been suggested by Cornell and a lot of other places. So make your lawn filled with clover and I'll keep the groundhogs there instead of in your garden. I did put clover seed out front a couple of weeks ago, so I hope it works. Oh, good. They'll love it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mel. I've actually had the same experience putting a distraction crop, they just don't go to the other parts of the yard. It's quite, it's quite something. They're very happy where they are. Cool. So attention to the metal edging outlining the path. How did you bend that? Oh, that, that that's really good stuff. I found that um, when I did my side garden a few years ago, I think Lowe sells it and it comes in green and it comes in brown and it bends. It's very flexible. And what's good about that edging versus the black rubber stuff that they sell, which I don't like, because it always pops up out of the ground, is that you hammer it in, it's got little stakes and it stays. Um, so I love that stuff. Um, and I, as I said, I think Lowe's has it, uh, both in Milford and I think I had to go to Derby to get more of it, but it's great. People were also curious about the backhoe in terms of where did you resource the backhoe? Where when I'm next door, next door, I said, anybody have a backhoe? Um, you know, next door has its um, fine points. And that's one of them is that if you ask someone for help, people know people. And so one woman wrote to me and said, my son has a backhoe. So, you know, I had, he, he came and gave me a prize and another guy came and gave me a prize and I hired one of them. And many, many thanks here for the uh, name of the brush scrubber. Oh, that thing is, that people I love that thing. They make them in big, bigger sizes. I bought the small one, but if you have bigger shrubs and you have a bigger truck, um, you can get them in different sizes. I also wanted to remind people that um, this is being recorded. And so we, you can listen to Pam's presentation once again, and we will be sending that recording out to everybody who's registered. So thank you so much for that question. Let's see. Um, a few more questions here and then we'll wrap it up. Let me see here. Now, uh, Questions about the ground cover once again. If there was a particular type of native ground cover that you used or are you planning to use to um, in your gardens? Well, where I've cleared uh, last year in the shady area, I'm anxious to kind of see what happens back there on its own. Um, I don't want to, I don't think I want to use a ground cover because I, I like the natural look, but I also recognize that some things are going to resprout. Um, I'm not going to clear the leaves off where they fell. I'm going to let that stay and, and hopefully that'll smother some resurgence. In the sunnier area where I have nothing growing right now, I was hoping to put down some um, the creeping phlox for color. That's a native plant that I like. And um, there are native seed mixes. If I wanna keep that meadow devil may care sort of look, I just need to find the ones that have native flowers in them um, and put those in. I'm also kind of eyeing how to put in another walkway. So I have not access to get in there and maybe put a bench. I bought, a, I made a, a little memorial for Kipper that I wanna have on a bench out there. So he'll always be with me there. So I wanna have something carved out where I can walk in and continue to weed, but also uh, plant around it. So I'm probably gonna end up with a seed mix for those areas. 
Well, and I also, we will be passing this right over to Mel to talk about the native plant sale. And there will be just a number of ground cover solutions that people can resource and learn a little bit more about by visiting the Aspatuck Land Trust website. So we can, um, people can enjoy that as well. Yeah, so I, I'm very anxious to get on that plant sale and, and see what there is this year. You know, I've got Pachysandra growing on the side. Somebody put it in at some point. And since I cleared all that burning bush, it's really taken off. So I got to get rid of that. But the wild ginger that I put in, in the shady area is very happy. So I would recommend that for a shady area. Well, speaking of a shady air area, what are your favorite shade plants? Well, I have a lot of plants in my garden that are not native. I mentioned that in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And like the hostas, that's, you, you can get your heart broken with hostas, but they do, when they get established, take up a lot of space. But I love the way the ferns that I put in, look, the native ferns are just so delicate and so elegant. And there's so many different ones that you can put in. And it does look like this just natural woodland garden. And if you put in next to that things like the wild ginger, the colors really contrast beautifully. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping to put more of that in this year as resources and time allows. Well, Pam, we're down to the last few questions here. Thank you so much for uh, fielding so many of these questions. No what about stilt grass? Did you have to deal with stilt grass in your yard? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mention it because, I mean, I feel like everybody's got stilt grass. Um, <laughs> I would get on my hands and knees and just grab it by the bunches. And it comes out really easily. And uh, you need to get it before it goes to seed. So I've heard that you can cut it and it won't recur, but I didn't have much luck with that. So um, the yard that I'm, the area of yard that I'm gonna be working on this year has some on the edging. And then near there in the grass is where it kind of took off to. So every year I go in there and I pull out as much as possible. And then when, if it drops its seeds, you're doomed because it's really hard to get them up. So you want to get it before it goes to seed. And the seed, if, if it gets really long, you can see the seeds are tiny on the end. So uh, just be persistent with it. And I'll tell you, um, when I first started pulling it, I had quite a bit. Last year, I had less. And I'm hoping this year will be even, um, even more, even fewer plants. But um, I don't expect it's ever going to be gone 100%. My neighbors have it. It's it's going to get here. So you just have to keep after it. Thanks, Pam. And one question here about Asian jumping worms. Have you found, encountered any of them on your property? Yeah. Um, in fact, I just learned about what they were. Like I didn't realize that they weren't earthworms until uh, my master gardener class. So I have seen them. And, um, you know, there's not really a formal response to them yet, but I think we're supposed to gather them and not let them live in the garden uh, because they are invasive and they're gross. Um, so they, they have a very specific look to them. They have a stripe. If you go online and you look up jumping worms, you'll go, oh yeah, I've seen that. And they do, they jump. They're very active once you uncover them. Um, in my master gardener class last night, the, the excellent teacher recommended that when you bring plants home from a nursery to take the dirt off of the roots and rinse them off, don't use the dirt from the nursery and put it in fresh dirt in your yard because even just from the nursery, you could be moving those worms into your garden. Thank you so much. And we, we are learning a little bit about the cocoons and, and how how they, they are there. And again, the Yukon website was that you referred to has some tremendous information. It's a great resource. Asian jumping worms, exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And we're really, we've wrapped up, we've wrapped up the questions here. We, we actually have one more that uh, I'd be curious about here. Um, hearing the difference uh, between non-natives, they're adding food and other resources for native animals and insects, and those which are invasive without making uh, additions. I guess this question is, are there places to turn to, to know which fall into which category? So 
what I'm taking from this question, and Julie, you can certainly jump in and clarify for us what you're what you're looking for here, um, is really learning more about natives and which add to the landscape in terms of providing food mm -hmm. for animals and insects, and which um, and and you know how to really how to really navigate this question, how to learn more really about what sustains our our native animals and insects in the landscape. You know, it, it, there's certainly invasives are, invasives have a specific definition and I don't wanna go through it here cause I won't remember the whole thing but you can look up what an invasive is. I have peonies in my yard and when the blossoms come out there are ants all over them. So it, it's providing something for insects um, I have hellebore, also known as Lenten rose. It's blooming right now. It's one of the first flowers in the spring. So there is a benefit to some of these things. I mean, they say that butterfly bush is an invasive. I have one, it smells lovely and it has put other plants around it. So I keep pulling them out. But as long as I keep that one plant, um, I feel like if I keep that one plant trimmed, it provides nectar to the swallowtails. They're all over that thing. So again, the, the, the rule I read recently and what Mel taught me as well is that you wanna strive for 70% native in your yard. It doesn't have to be 100%. And I'm not at 70% yet. I hope to be by the end of this year, maybe the end of next year. But 70% is really what you need. That's the baseline for wildlife and pollinators. Well, Pam, thank you. And there's so many resources on our Aspetuck Land Trust website, the Wild Seed Project. And of course, Doug Tallamy provides us so much re information in his books and resources as well. And don't this forget point, the Pollinator Pathway website, pollinator-pathway.org has got a ton of resources. Absolutely, you jumped on that so quickly and maybe um, Mel can drop that right into our chat today. I know Holly Kosted is on the call as well. You might be able to do that for us. Mm -hmm. Tremendous resources as well. The Pollinator Pathway will really help uh, educate and provide more information as well. So Julie, I hope that answered your question. And Pam, thank you so, so much. We've wrapped up our questions here, our experience for the people who have joined us. And I'd like to bring it back over to Mel. Thank you. Great, hi everybody. Thank you so much, Pam. That was just incredible. I, re <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I was laughing out loud and you didn't hear me, which is too bad, but uh, it, it was just so in inspiring and, you know, just a very human lecture, which was fantastic. So thank you so much. And and um, yeah, I've already got my wish list for uh, you know getting out there and replacing some of these invasives in my yard too. So um, thank you again, Pam. And uh, I encourage everybody uh, to um, go on to the Aspatuck Land Trust website and uh, keep your eye open. The plant sale will open for the public online um, April 14th, but if you're a member, we will be sending a link out to you um, either today or tomorrow. Uh, if you're not a member, I would suggest you jump online and become a member and then you'll have a whole week to order these plants before it opens to the public. Um, we have a great selection this year with a lot more ferns and a lot more um, ground covers, which we didn't have before and um, a lot big, uh, bigger plants than we did in the past. Um, so we do have some flats and, and plugs, but a lot of one quart up to one gallon, uh, more established natives for your yard. So um, keep an eye out for the plant sale. And uh, we, hopefully we, we too, with all of this work Pam put in, if we put that same amount of work in, we can have the same uh, paradise for pollinators and birds in our backyard. So um, I thank you everybody for joining. As always, we have another Lunch and Learn next week. On Wednesday, um, we have uh, a, a, a speaker from um, Old Lyme, um, who's going to talk to us about her Nix the Knotweed initiative. Um, and she just is just such an incredible wealth of knowledge about not only knotweed, but all um, 
the invasives. So uh, get on with us and Suzanne Thompson next Wednesday uh, for another Lunch and Learn. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a great Thank week. you, everyone. Thank you, Mel. We'll see you bye next Bye-bye, Pam. Bye-bye, Mel. Bye, 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 bye everyone. Bye, everyone. It's a nice day out there. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.